more than 11 members lonely in a room. We want to be millions. Um, we want to be strong, and we want all of you to join. Um, to do that, you can also go online, harborcoalition.org slash membership. Um, and while you're there, you might as well check out the rest of the website. Uh, we got a lot going on. You can like us on Facebook. It's very exciting. Um, and we also, we're looking for people to step up as team leaders in their district. Um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but we will be trying to set up meetings in each of these districts this summer. So if you have a relationship with, uh, <coughs> your congressional office or a Senate, a Senate office, a state office. We're going to get to the, the state and local government too, but we're starting in, in D.C. If you have a relationship, you can help us reach that office. You can help us be successful this way. Um, we will let you know after this event, and we can uh, we can put you in, in charge of a team and get you started. So uh, that's that's the Harvard Coalition, and it uh, hopefully fits into the message of the day. And uh, we hope to see you all out there. Thank you.
20 miles long, our shoreline down in places that in reverse array reduces in activities. We still boast one of the busiest ports in the U.S., but our harbor is now also recognized as a habitat for hundreds of species of birds and fish. It is surrounded by parks. Uh, it is an estuary of national importance. Um, it is a place for viewing and studying nature and a place for recreation, from biking trails to boat launches. In fact, nearly 40% of our total shoreline is, uh, is, uh, is dominated by parks and natural areas and beaches. In recent years, we've opened parks and greenways on the waterfront, restored natural habitats, and fostered all manner of recreation. Just a few years ago, as I think I said yesterday, this conference would have been about staking and playing on the waterfront, but we finally achieved a point where that, that claim has been staked. Um, we are redefining our relationship to our waterways, evidenced by the wave of waterfront parks, greenways and ferries and boat launches, marinas, and even, even all the housing that's emerged along the waterfront. In a larger sense, we're also redefining our civic identity. Um, we are, as NWA has proclaimed, a city of water. So what are the next steps? New waterfront parks are a part of the dramatic transformation of New York City shoreline and a hallmark of the park renaissance fostered by Plan YC. Since 2002, we acquired roughly 730 acres of new parkland across the city. Uh, of that, nearly 400 acres are on the waterfront. Last year, uh, the administration released Vision 2020, building on the success of city planning's original 1992 comprehensive waterfront plan uh, by reasserting commitments uh, to goals such as open space and the working waterfront. The plan was steered by the Department of City Planning, backed by the Mayor's Office, the Parks Department, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, and with significant contributions by many community groups and citizen advocates for the waterfront. Roland was a, uh, was a very significant participant in that process. Thinking about the transformation of our harbor uh, as an environmental engine and economic resource, I first want to mention a, a little known space, uh, Grand Ferry Park on the Williamsburg waterfront uh, at the splayed foot of Grand Street. In 1998, one of only a small handful of places one could get anywhere near the water in that part of Brooklyn. Grand Ferry Park became an early example of the type of public-private partnership that is today one of the defining features of our waterfront workshops. The Parks Council, now uh, New Yorkers for Parks, was the inspiration. The Parks Department provided the uh, resources. Unusual at that time, we chose, rather than a traditional bulkheaded sea rail, to install a riprap shoreline that allows the park goers to clamber over the rocks and actually get to the water. For an agency like ours, so moving beyond these notions of liability and you can't do that, you can't try that, is really a big step. Uh, yeah. Bronx River is uh, also a great model for our push to clean up the, and revitalize the waterfront. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, the river was blighted and polluted. It wasn't that long ago that residents of areas such as Hunts Point barely knew the river existed. However, in the 1990s, an alliance of citizens, neighborhood groups, and civic leaders began to press for the city's attention. Local heroes such as Alexi Torres Fleming of Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, George Carter of Sustainable South Bronx, led the fight to reclaim the river. The city uh, eventually stepped in with the resources necessary to implement that transformation, with a lot of all other contributions, not just by the city, but by local elected officials who stepped in before most notably Congressman Jose Serrano. Today, the city's only freshwater river is reborn as a marvel of nature and human stewardship. Uh, I hope many of you have uh, been a part of the amazing Bronx River Flotilla. If you haven't, you really should. It's an incredible experience. Yesterday, uh, Roland described Hudson River Park as the grandfather of the reclamation of our city's waterfront. Uh, what's also notable is that beyond the the city-state partnership that emerged after years and years of bickering uh, is that the plan that came together was really a visionary plan in its own right. Uh, the Hudson River Park Act called not just for the creation of a park, but of an estuarine sanctuary.
estuary of, uh, along the waters uh, comprising the park. Uh, uh, so the park plan, which is still in development, also includes boathouses, as you know, from right next door, get downs, uh, things that are still underway, but, but they will happen. Uh, of course, Hudson River Park didn't introduce kayaking and, and boating to the river here. The downtown boathouse and the uh, uh, floating the apple were here for years beforehand. But again, what's notable is that you know, so often government gets in with its great new idea and then winds up killing the goose. Uh, fortunately, in this case, the city uh, and the state were smart enough to recognize what an incredible asset these boathouses were. And uh, before the movement had really grown to what it's become today, um, those uses were included in the park. Uh, in 2002, the Parks Department entered its first partnership with MWA, uh, utilizing the grant they obtained uh, and city capital funding we had to develop a new park along the Harlem River. We were able to partner a marine scientist, an engineer, and a landscape architect, which sounds like a joke, right? Marine engineer, landscape architect, and scientist along the river. Uh, but what resulted in 2008 uh, was a new approach to, for New York City at least, a new approach to addressing waterfront edge and it's a you know it's a, it's a notable site because it's a very narrow site we didn't have real estate to give up creating a beach or a, or a riprap battered uh, shoreline um, what we used were planted gatherings stacked um, that are have now have, have become a sort of a living shoreline uh, and and that that approach is now part of our palette to design and work on the parks around the city which is a great thing uh, North Brooklyn Waterfront presented a particular challenge, uh, but in another example of innovation, the city used its zoning toolbox to leverage new parks along a privately owned and seemingly inaccessible stretch of the waterfront. The 2005 rezoning of approximately 175 blocks of privately owned land along the Blue Point and William, uh, Williamsburg Waterfront will ultimately yield a nearly two mile stretch of public esplanade. Uh, in exchange for creating substantial value for landowners through the upzoning, the city used its waterfront zoning regulations to require developers to set aside their waterfront edge for public access. As each development site moves forward, the owners are required to design, build, and maintain their waterfront edge as a public access area. And then we are taking that a step further, going to each developer and negotiating with them to, to donate that waterfront esplanade to the city so that it kind of can become public parkland. Also included in the Greenpoint uh, plan are provisions for the creation of a new 27-acre uh, park at Bushwick Inlet, portions of which have already been acquired uh, and approved, and then creation and expansion of other waterfront parks, including Transmitter Park, which will open very soon on the uh, former broadcast site of WMYC Radio. Uh, and of course, let's not forget about Brooklyn Bridge Park. Here, through adaptive reuse, we are turning a chain of outmoded shipping piers and warehouses into a waterfront park with beaches, fishing piers, canals, paddling waters, and restored wetlands. Brooklyn Bridge Park will be to the 21st century what Prospect Park was to the 19th century. The park is also important because of its sustainable design features that include managing stormwater to irrigate lawns, constructed wetlands and the reuse of materials found both on site and brought in from other construction projects around the city. In this way, the reclamation of the waters around Brooklyn Bridge Park was expanded to include the restoration of the lands above. In 2007, we brought the floating pool lady to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Then the following year, uh, and then, then the following year and ever since to Beretta Point Park in the Bronx. In doing so, we symbolically reintroduced swimming to the East River uh, for the first time in generations. We also demonstrated that recreation on the waterfront is not just something for those who can afford a yacht or a cruise. Our harbor belongs to everyone. It was great being on a panel yesterday with one of the uh, designers of the plus pool concept. Um, so when it cuts right down to it, floating pool lady is just a traditional pool that happens to be on a barge. The next step in the evolution of Floating pools will be a, um, a version that actually engages and uses river.
river water. And that will become the next step forward to a day when the harvest waters are clean enough that people can actually swim in them. And we'll reintroduce the real floating pools of the 19th century, the ones that were just open swimming rings. Um, and let's not forget about EcoDocs, our latest partnership with NWA, which will become a companion piece to our blue network, the New York City Water Trail. Like the network of launch sites emerging across the five boroughs, EcoDocs, EcoDocs will function as a threshold so that a shoreline is no longer a uh, dividing line between water and land, but a transition point uh, between our city's two vast open space networks, our 29,000 acres of terrestrial uh, parks and our much greater uh, area of, of public waters. So what will 21st century parks look like? How can we best design them to ensure a sustainable future for us and successive generations? The last thing I'd like to mention is a not so little exercise we're working on with the National Park Service about the future of Jamaica Bay. Some of you may be aware that a year ago, Mayor Bloomberg and Interior Secretary Ken Salazar signed an agreement pledging cooperation between the city and the federal government. Jamaica Bay has 10,000 acres of park, public park land that was arbitrarily ripped apart into two pieces back in 1972 for the creation of Gateway National Recreation Area. About 7,000 acres of federal park land and 3,000 acres of municipal park land. Jamaica Bay parks have never reached their full potential, but we firmly believe that this potential can be realized by our agencies working together, bringing focus to environmental stewardship, to education, and to recreation programming. It's an amazing resource, one that could be a true destination for New Yorkers and visitors from afar who want to experience the Bay's abundant ecological features and habitats, its historic resources and beaches. My goal is to one day bicycle to Jamaica Bay, rent a kayak to go visit uh, the Marsh Islands in the middle of the bay, then come back in the afternoon and relax on an oceanfront beach, camp there that night, and take a ferry back to my Lower East Side neighborhood the next morning. And stay tuned because that could happen. Um, but it will require the voice of the local communities and advocates to help support the effort that will come together. New York City is fortunate to have citizens who care about their parks, including more than 55,000 individual volunteers registered with the Parks Department and 2,000 community groups who plan to paint, program, and advocate. Despite uncertainty over future budgets or future administrations, community advocacy is the best means of ensuring that parks remain a funding priority. Through strong public-private partnerships and community involvement, we create a vest vested interest in seeing that our parks continue to thrive. That's especially important as we face a major transition in this city about 18 months from now. So thank you very much.